Self denial is the foundation and bedrock of the Christian faith. We have very smartly crafted a generation of people who are churchgoers who love a prosperity message but do not love Christ. Matthew 16 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, the first part of that verse says, If anyone desires to come after me, all of us have desires. We have desires for prosperity, desires for protection desires for pleasures but Jesus speaking to his disciples speaks of a different kind of a desire it is a desire to follow him all your earthly desires can only find its true expression when you desire to go after Christ the Bible says if anyone desires to follow me then there are certain prerequisites first thing deny yourself the rich young ruler could not do this because he was too attached to his possessions. He was possessed by his possessions. Jesus told him, go sell everything, dispossess yourself of all you possess, then come and follow me. I wonder if God had to tell you to sell your car, will you be ready to give it away? Or sell your house and then come and follow me? Or give away all that you possess? You see, in the early 80s and 90s when I was growing up as a child I saw lots of demons being cast out and we would say people are demon possessed anybody saw a demon I'm telling you I keep saying it but one of the Sundays I'm really praying that we have a manifestation of a demon here because of a couple of questions we used to ask them where are you from who sent you then we'll dance with this demon there'll be a nice show now the demon used to say I came from next door now there used to be so much of trouble in the neighborhood because after the demon was cast out, the people in the house are fighting with the neighbor because they said the neighbor did it. But Satan is a father of lies. So he will lie. By the way, if a demon manifests in this church, then I will not tolerate it for more than two minutes. Go, leave in the name of Jesus, finish. We'll concentrate on what we have to concentrate on. But today people are not possessed by demons, they are possessed by their possessions. That's why somebody will tell you, hey, make sure you, you dust your feet before you come into my car. No, my house, you're coming into my house, you be very careful, take your shoes out. You must deny yourself, you must empty yourself, it's called the kenosis process. That's what Jesus did when he came to the cross, he emptied himself, he made himself of no reputation. Peter and the disciples left all to follow Jesus. And this is what you must do. You must have no reputation. Take on the form of a bond servant. You must be able to say like John, he must increase and I must decrease. If you truly want to deny yourself, there must be less of I and more of him, even in your talking. For Christ to increase, you must decrease. And the decrease requires self-denial. John realized that it was no longer about him, but it was more about Christ. And Christ must be magnified in and through us. And he says, deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. That means you are denying yourself, and in that understanding, we are dedicated to living for the benefit of another. This is the very nature of the Lamb of God. And Jesus gave himself so that others could live. Death will be working in us, so life could be working in others. Deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. The true expression of the agape of God is when we deny ourselves and others benefit. Our love for God can only be expressed truly in the way we love one another. It is alien for many people that go to church today to hear messages of this nature on self-denial because the culture that we live in revolves around the unholy trinity of me, myself and I. 
Everything God created does not exist for the created thing, but exists for the benefit of someone else. When a seed becomes a herb, then the herb becomes a plant and it becomes a tree and it gives off fruit, the tree is not existing for itself. It is existing to give shade to the traveler. It is existing to give a nesting place for the bird. The tree is existing to give fruit and in its fruit it's got seed to produce more trees. Everything exists for the benefit of another. But only we seem to be existing for ourselves. And this is the gospel we have imbibed. It is an egocentric gospel. Paul said, if anyone brings to you any other gospel than the one I bring to you, let him be accursed. Now, there's an old saying, you are what you eat. You remember that old Farmer Brown ad? <laughs> they look so good because they... I tell you, believers today are looking so bad because they eat so bad. And they're eating the wrong doctrines. They're eating Western doctrines that will not bring us to the place of expressing the nature of Christ. The foundational principle in the kingdom of God is self-denial. Self-denial. Mortify the flesh. Know how to become a sacrificial giver. Become a one that loves. This is building other people up. Everything in the kingdom of God must be for the benefit of another. This is authentic church. This is authentic Christianity. Authentic genuine faith is when we have the culture of the kingdom. That is doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. Authentic Christianity is when we are focused on oneness. Not unity. Oneness. You can have Man United, like we use the example on the soccer pitch. But after they go away, Cristiano Ronaldo is doing an interview with P.S. Morgan. Showing how divided they are as a team. We come together, we need to be oneness. Where we are joined to one another. And I'll talk about how we must feel one another's pain. A man is not independent of his wife. And a wife is not independent of her husband. The two shall become one. When we are genuine, we have covenant communities. We seem to be exposed more to the fake than the genuine. And that's why you can't tell the difference. We're not going to build a church building and not build each other up. We as a community of people need to be building other people. What you do for others, God will do for you. I remember five years ago, I was sharing this testimony with somebody the other day. When we had no idea that we will ever be purchasing or owning a building, we took 100,000 rand and we gave 50,000 to two churches that were in a building process. Now, people don't realize what seed can do. We just gave the two churches 50,000, 50,000 and that was that. Gave the money away and we left with basically nothing. Because those two churches were building their buildings. What you do for others, God will do for you. God did it, not pastor. So we are building other people up. But Seema's father is a pastor in Durban, in a place called Verulam. Anybody know where is Verulam? The registration is NJ. <laughs> And that has been one of the greatest perplexities in my mind for the last 40 years. Because I'm wondering still, why, what is NJ? You know, I thought it was near Joburg or something like that. <laughs> but Merv and Sima, as a church today, we will release a seed of 10,000 rand towards your father's building, like we said. We want, because they're finishing it and they needed some money to just finish the ceiling. And guess what? We need the ceiling too in a few days. <laughs> so what we do for others, God will do for us. So grace and peace, we will have that done. Come on, we don't have the money. I love living like that. I don't, my wife doesn't, but I love it. I love living on edge with God. The principle is this. It is helping. It is celebrating. It is honoring. It is blessing others before yourself. 
And when you come to self-denial, this is a non-negotiable. Abraham was showing us this principle. When what did Abraham do? First, he gave to the 318 men born in his own house. He blessed them. He poured into them. The word is ruk in the Hebrew. It means to arm them, to resource them. So he pours into the 318 men. Then he gave preference to Lot. He said, Lot, you take whatever land you want. You go through the one way, I'll go the other way. You go that way, I'll go this way. What is that? That's called preferential treatment. When you come to the table sometimes and there's a last slice of the Chateau Gatto cake left. <laughs> you say you can have it. This is giving preference to another. I want you to understand how you give preference to other people. Be a blessing. There are many scriptures that point to this. Romans 15, verse number 1, 2 and 3. The Bible says, We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. And there's a part that I wanted to get to. And not to please ourselves. Verse number 2. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good. Leading to edification. And then verse 3. For even Christ. There's a template. There's the model. There's the example. For Christ did not please himself. For Christ did not please himself. As you follow after Christ. We must bear with the weaknesses of others. And not please ourselves. We want to only please ourselves. Philippians 2. For Paul is writing from prison and this is what he says let each of you look out not only for your own lights and water but also for the interests of others the, the eye of a son of God is so well trained to discern where there is needs and deficiencies and he wants to fill that gap. You walk into an environment, you say, fill that gap. The other day, someone from our church heard that one of the cleaners in their school, their child got accepted with a full bursary at St. Mary's. And the child is living in a township. So the child needed a laptop. So immediately the eye of a son of God is trained now. Because when you go to St. Mary's, you can't go with the Nokia 2110. <laughs> you got to go with all the gadgets. Then they tried now to meet the need. And guess what? The need got met by the people in this church. And that is not put on Facebook. Sometimes the media might get all of it. They might call you for comment. SABC, Auckland Park, reporting live. Whatever is born of God loves. And love is an actionable word. You cannot say you love without doing. Don't say you love God and you can't do anything. And when you love, you want to be an expression of that father's love to others. You are expressing the father's love. If you can't give, you've got to check out whether the software has been downloaded and every time you need a software upgrade, you have a car to go a little bit faster, you need a software upgrade. Your phone will tell you it's time for that upgrade, that iPhone will tell you. And I'm telling you sometimes, because we live in a culture that is so self-consumed, the environment is crafting us. Why should I do this for another? Why should I do that for someone else? And I was speaking to someone and the person with tears in the eyes said to me, Pastor, do you know what you did seven years ago? I said, no, I don't know. He said, no, for a whole year, you all paid our child's school fees. It was 3,300 in a month. And he said, because of what you all did today, we are in such a safe place as a family. 1 Corinthians 10, 24 says, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. The other's well-being. This is an instruction from the Lord. You remember we were, we were in the church and we used to sing the song, Cast your burden unto Jesus. 
And it was a good time because people were losing weight. You used to do hi, hi, low, low. Now we must sing songs like that. But there's a problem with that song. I like this song. Wider, wider, all of that we used to do. A lot of exercise. Problem is we sing, cast your burdens unto Jesus. You sitting there and doing nothing. When you can carry the burden for someone else. You might think, hey, we are not in a 5,000 seater auditorium. Let me tell you, the potency that is in this church and what this church will do will be more than mega churches can ever do in the earth. Amen. I am telling you that. I'm telling you that. So you better get used to this type of messages because doctrine determines practice and what you are being taught will determine how we're going to behave. Promoting other people, blessing other people, honoring other people is the very fabric and fiber of our Christian faith. In Genesis chapter 38 from verse 29, we read the story of a lady by the name of Tamar who's going to have twins. And there are twins in the womb, and you will get to know them just now, Zerah and Perez. But these twins are very different from the twins that Rebekah carried. Rebekah carried Jacob and Esau. Whilst those boys were in the womb, they were fighting. There is competing there. The different action taking place in the womb of Tamar. We're picking up the story in verse 27. I'll give you the context. Now it came to pass at the time for giving birth that behold, twins were in her womb. Verse 28. And so it was when she was giving birth that the one put out his hand and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand saying, this one came out first. Verse 29. Then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly and he said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore his name is called Perez. Now when the hand came out first, they wanted to know who was the firstborn. So the midwife ties the scarlet thread around the hand of the one who came out first. But the hand goes in. And the brother breaks through. So Perez came out first with the scarlet thread. And Zerah came out last. Don't say second. Only two people competing in the race. You're either first or last. <laughs> the first shall be. And the last shall be. You see on the first day God created light. And on the last day he created man. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. It was always in the mind of God for man to be light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Then he said, you are the light of the world. Now let me tell you something about light. Light travels at two... I'm going to pull a Jacob Zuma here. Light travels... <laughs> At 299,792,458 meters per second. But sound travels only at 343 meters per second. Sound is what you hear. Sound are hearers. Light is what we see. Light is doers. What you hear does not make you light. What you do makes you light. What you do is seen. Therefore, when you do what you hear, you become light. Ah, no, you want me to pull a TD, Jake? Say, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. You got to get excited about the word of God. I'll say that again. What you do is seen. Therefore, when you do what you hear, you become the light. The transmission of the light, Jesus Christ inside of us, will be faster when we do the word of God. Do the word of God. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The Bible says in Isaiah 60, darkness covers the earth. And there's darkness covering the earth right now, thick darkness. But you and I as the church must shine to handle the darkness that's, that's pervading the earth right now. Light does several things. I'm not going to go into it. 
I want to just give you one example of light. When you read the story of Genesis chapter 37, when Joseph has this dream, Joseph goes to his father and he tells him the dream. And he says, the sun, the moon and the stars were all bowing before me. Sun, moon and 11 stars. The sun, moon and stars are all located in the heaven, but they all give off light. There was an interpretation. Jacob says to Joseph, do you think your mother and I and your 11 brothers are going to bow down to you? The sun, the moon and 11 stars. The sun and the moon represented the mother and the father. The 11 stars represented the brother. The sun, moon and stars is a family unit. What is the biggest decay of postmodern society? Family. Family. When you get your act together as a family, you become light. <laughs> Because when they got into a place called Egypt, there was a little place, it was called Goshen. There was darkness in all of Egypt, but light was shining in Goshen because there was a family unit. Don't think about being the CEO of some large corporate. Start off by being the O in your family. And God will promote you to be the CEO. I don't got no problem with you being the CEO. I met a pastor the other day. He gave me his card. CEO of some ministries. I'm thinking, hey, you think you're the CEO? People put the stickers on the car. Fish sign. Put the cross in the car. No problem with the cross in the car. Put the cross on the neck. I love that. If you want to buy me a Christmas present, I love a 22 carat gold chain with a cross. But I'd rather be nailed to the cross and live a life that shows the light and have all those things that are external and have no display of a crucified life. Please don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. I, I, in fact, the other day my wife bought my son a chain. She doesn't know this with a cross. And I was saying, why she didn't buy one for me as well? <laughs> When Zerah came out first, when Zerah came out and he broke through the womb, he had the scarlet thread around his hand. And the name Perez is a very interesting name. It means, how did you break through? So imagine everywhere you go, your name is Perez, and people ask, how did you break through? How did you break through? Let me tell you, some people are going to ask me, Pastor, how did you build your church building? How did you get through university? Hey, you came from a poor family. How did you get through? How did you break through? And you know what his response could have been? I have a brother who broke through for me. He put his hand out and then he pulled it back and he pushed me out first. Someone broke through for someone else. Perez became great because of his brother. Now when you look into the genealogy of Jesus, you will find Perez's name mentioned. It will say, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah, and Judah begot Perez. Zerah's name is not mentioned. Zera slips into obscurity whilst his brother remains in the lineage of Jesus. Will you be able to give someone that level of preference to push them forward? This is the spirit of a son of God. Now let's look at the question. If you had to ask Zera, Zera, why you did it? Zera will probably answer this way, I did it for no reward. I just wanted my brother to go first. Here's a question now. Do you have the scarlet thread around your hand? Do I have it? Are you helping others to come out first? This is when you are ready to live in absolute obscurity with no Facebook followers or Instagram followers. And you just do a good deed because it is the very nature of Christ in you to do it. 
You can't help it but do it. You don't take a dog to barking school. And you don't also take a snake to biting school. It's in you. Whom have you pushed forward? Who have you caused to advance? What is your purpose? What is your purpose in life? Some of us want to climb the corporate ladder. You'll climb the corporate ladder and find out that the ladder was on the wrong wall when you get to the top. Because it'll be empty. The essence of the kingdom of God is not self-promotion, but it is to promote another. We have a society that is consumed by social media. And social media wants to promote nothing but our carnality. If you want to be mighty and experience the manifest presence of God, be a Zerah. There are so few Zerahs around today. People are not looking for accolades. People are not looking for compensation. People are not looking for vote of thanks. What is the difference between Ubuntu and Agape? Ubuntu requires reciprocation. Agape does it with no need for recognition. That's why all these systems in the world will fail. We've got to come back to the cross and cross-examine our hearts. Okay, you didn't get that. Cross-examine our hearts. Start with the small things. Be practical with you. Start with the small things. Pack an extra slice of lunch for some kid at school that's in your child's class. Bless someone who can't afford something that your child has. Start with the little things, then migrate. The Lord told me that I must bless somebody with a car. I told myself, Lord, no, you're lying to me now. You can't do this to me. <laughs> not now, God, not now. <laughs> You'll never give somebody a car if you can't give someone your bag. Start somewhere. How many shoes you need? <laughs> Ladies, how many bags you need? How many TVs you can watch at one time? How many RS3s can you drive at one time? How about settling someone else's bond? You know what you do? You deliver them from 20 years of bondage. Settle it in one day. Gone. Finish. Live free. Gave their children a free asset. Pray for others. Bless others. Don't ask. Oh, pastor, when are you going to promote me in the church? You know, I'm so faithful. No, don't ask for it. Just do it in obscurity. Quietly, close mouth, deaf ear. God will promote you. God will lift you up. There are many people in the Bible who are zeras to other people. You might say, I am such a bad person. Can God use me? I'll tell you, yes, God can use you. You know why? God used a lady by the name of Rahab. And Rahab had a very powerful profession. Rahab was a harlot. But God used Rahab the harlot to be a Zerah for the nation of Israel. God will use someone like Priscilla and Aquila to be a Zerah to Apollos. Barnabas was a Zerah to Paul. When you look at the Old Testament, this is the very nature of the priesthood. In the Old Testament, the people were crossing over the Jordan. But how I many of you know the priests had to go stand first in the water and then craft the pathway, open up the waters for the people to walk through. And if you don't know this, but sometimes your pastor is walking before you, breaking through some ground, making sure that the pathway is safe for you to walk in. That's the very nature of a priesthood. Do you have the scarlet thread in your hand? Whom do I push forward? If you know this mighty God, you'll experience his power. Cyrus took care of an entire nation's budget. Do you know that Cyrus did that? He had a Cyrus anointing. 
If you don't come to this place where you are blessing others consistently, there will be no light. Why do we need to go anywhere and tell people I'm a Christian? People must know that you're a son of God. Some people have the audacity to go somewhere and speak in other tongues. That's when the people want to believe they're Christians. But when they go home, they're speaking in other kind of tongues. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, the Bible says, These are the men who came to David at Ziklag. And he was a fugitive from Saul. And they were among the mighty men. And they were helpers in the war. If you're going to journey with me, what I need right now is helpers in the war. Verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Amasai. Look at that word, Amasai. It is a compound Indian word. Ama and Sai. <laughs> compound. But the name Amasai is so interesting. It means burden bearer. Not armor bearer, burden bearer. And this is the spirit of a burden bearer. What we need in Zoe Community Church is the spirit of Amasai. Comes to David, his leader, and he says this, We are yours, O oh David. We are on your side. See, when you say we are yours, you can say, take me wherever you want to use me. We are yours. It's like Samuel saying to Eli, here I am. We are yours, O oh David. We are on your side, O oh son of Jesse. In the war, you can't be on the fence. You can't be supporting Liverpool one day and United the next day. You can't watch any match and not in the back of your mind choose to support one of those teams. We are on your side, O oh son of Jesse. Peace to you, peace to your helpers, for your God helps you. So David received them. Even in your marriage, you must live for the benefit of your spouse. Next time you come, I'm going to write another certificate with your marriage certificate and give you a death certificate. <laughs> you can't be married in this 21st century without being dead to your own selfish desires and needs. Hmm? Certain things in your marriage, you must pretend like you can't hear. <laughs> your wife is too sharp for you. You can't have a debate with her. You must accept it. When you go home, you're not this big shot apostle, bishop, prophet. You are there, your wife will talk to you. And marriage is not a competition. I've seen many couples competing with each other. We died and we live for the benefit of one another in our marriage. All the people who have successful marriages. My parents were married for 44 years. Well, I didn't hear my father respond to my mother on many occasions. And he'll whistle his way past and carry on. To me. <laughs> Luke 10 is the story of the good Samaritan. Verse number 30, Luke 10, 30. And Jesus answered and said to them, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him. Watch what the Samaritan is doing. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him and on the next day when he departed he took out two denarii gave them to the innkeeper and said take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again I will repay you this is the story of taking care of someone else in need but he had to go to him the good Samaritan first thing he does is bandaged him but I'm sure in those days they didn't carry first aid kits in the car so the only way he could have bandaged him was he took off his Versace shirt and bandaged him. This is what we need. And then he spends resource. He spends two denarii. Now two denarii is equal to two days wages because one denarii was for one day's wages. 
two denarii are two days wages. Now if you are a lawyer, that two days wages is about 100,000 rand. And if you're a surgeon, that's about a million rand. But he took it and how many of you know, a thousand years, he says one day. Work out the two denarii principle. He pours the oil and he heals the wounds and he stops the bleeding. And the exchange takes place. He brings him to the place where there's food, where there's shelter. Now, this is a story of a man leaving Jerusalem and going alongside the priest and the Levite. And the Samaritan demonstrates something called self-denial. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up as a little boy, when we saw an accident, sometimes my father would stop. Go there, you know, see if people needed help. Today, if you go there, you'll get robbed. On the side of the road, that's what's going to happen to you. But those were the generation that we grew up in. This man gets off his donkey. He takes care of the injured man. And it is not done for reward. Now, let's talk about this happening if it happened to us today. Let's say the Levite and the priest were walking past. The first person is the Jehovah's Witness. You know what the Jehovah's Witness will do? He'll go leave his Watchtower series book there and he'll run away. <laughs> the second person who went is a Catholic. You know what the Catholic will do? He'll drink the wine. <laughs> the third person is a Methodist. The Methodist will say, you got your method wrong. The fourth person is an Anglican. The Anglican will say, you got the angles wrong. Oh, you fell into this place. The fifth person is a Presbyterian. The Presbyterian will say, we've got to call the church Presbytery together before we take you to the inn. We've got to check the budget out. And then we'll take you to the inn. Don't get too excited. We're coming to you just now. <laughs> the charismatic person, he will whew, blow on him. <laughs> the Pentecostal person, he starts speaking in other tongues. The apostolic person, the Greek word for bandage. <laughs> the etymology. The politician will come there. He'll take pictures of himself with the man for election campaign. The minister of health will come and he'll tell the good Samaritan, you've got to stop because you're violating health protocols. The DA will come. They'll give the man a cap and a nice t-shirt. The ANC will come. They'll give you a cap t-shirt and they'll give you half a chicken <laughs> the EFF will come they'll take all of that and the chicken and they say we are the EFF everything for free <laughs> what is the underlying problem we lost our compassion the man was moved with compassion let me tell you something and I say this to you with great conviction. Four months ago, my mother lost her husband. She's a grieving widow. And you know where's the worst place to be for a grieving widow today? The church. We've lost our compassion for one another. You know what the word compassion is in the Greek? Sorry, I have to go to the Greek word for compassion. <laughs> Splagizomai. You know what it means? It means to feel on the inside what someone is feeling on the outside. So while you have the wound on the outside, I feel the wound deep inside me. We have lost our compassion. Don't walk past somebody who can't afford a loaf of bread and tell them I'll pray for you. You've lost your compassion. Start feeling again. You know, church activities can kill us. We can become leprous. You know what leprosy does? Leprosy is when you lose the sensation on the end of your fingers and toes. I had the wonderful pleasure of going to a leper colony in India. You'll find many lepers don't have toes and fingers. Because they can't feel anymore. This place where the sore is, you lose your sensation because the nerve tissues get so badly damaged beneath the skin. 
We have a leprous church today. You know why we have leprosy? Ten lepers got healed. Only one came back. No sensitivity. Our churches can become leper colonies. We lack sensation. Lepers were thrown out of fellowship. If you can't be in fellowship with other believers, you got a serious problem. We have a generation like Gehazi that are running after Naaman when he gets healed. This is what we have. We have leper colonies. People who have underlying ambitions. I pray that you will become more sensitive to those that are around you. I'm praying as you've heard God's word, you will do things not because it's the right thing to do, but you are moved. When Jesus saw the multitudes, the Bible says, he was moved with compassion. Don't walk past the man who's wounded on the Jericho road and say, good, you deserve it. Why are you walking here? You knew it was late, it was dark. No, we're losing our compassion. God help us. I'm really praying that God has spoken to you to not to deny yourself. Bless others. Celebrate others. Honor others. Let grace be poured. Today I'm asking you, why do you want money? Why do you want more money? Why do you want more money? What do you need more money for? If you say to the Father, Lord, I want resource to bless another so that light can shine again on the earth, the Father will not withhold any good thing from you. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it. Some of us have to check things out and then you will know why the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. The word blessed means it's more joyful to give. You know why so many people are in depression today? You know why we have to be treating them with psychotropic drugs all the time? You know why? Because they don't know how to be a blessing to others. The moment you go and sit with a person who's a beggar on the street and give them five minutes of your time and you go back to your palace, you suddenly realize, oh, I've got so much in comparison to this person. You stop your murmuring. You stop your complaining. Just try it. Go to an old age home, sit with some of the old people. Their sons and daughters are flying high, driving Ferrari, going on the breakfast run. 9-11, Carrera S, driving, breakfast run. Mother and father sitting alone, never see them for weeks or months on end. No compassion. James says, as the apostle says, true and undefiled religion is to take care of widows and orphans. That's both natural widows and spiritual widows and orphans. I hope the Lord is speaking to us. Check out your time. Hey, I'm going to work, 7 o'clock, coming back, 6 o'clock. After that, I have to hit the treadmill down. Come back, 8 o'clock. Then we have to put the chicken breast on the griller. Because, you know, I'm having the special diet. He, all day went by. He thought about someone picking up the phone and saying, Hello, auntie, how are you doing? You okay? Yeah, I'm sending you an e-wallet. Can't do nothing for no one else. And you're wondering why you're so sad all the time. Wondering why you're so depressed all the time. Tell you something, joy will return to the church. The early church ate their food with gladness because they were serving one another. Grace, mercy and peace to you.